Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. The game clock is ticking on a Viking stadium bill, and the 39th governor's likeness takes its place in the Capitol. Those stories in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The state can move forward with borrowing to meet its short-term cash flow needs if necessary. That authority was recently granted by the Legislative Advisory Commission. Members agreed to Minnesota Management and Budget Commissioner Jim Showalter's request and point to a struggling economy as the reason it is important to have this tool available. The economic outlook uh, has obviously turned down pretty substantially. Speaker of the House Kurt Zellers joins me now to talk about last week's meeting and a little bit more broadly looking into next legislative session. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Let's begin with the Legislator, Legislative Advisory Commission. Last week unanimously granted approval to borrow a line of credit to meet cash flow needs if necessary. Now, if the state does borrow money, what are the long-term effects to taxpayers here in Minnesota? Well, it, it's short-term borrowing, so it would be uh, kind of like a line of credit on your on your home mortgage or your checking account. You know, if you if something big, uh, say a car payment uh, or excuse me, a, a car breaks down, you need to pay you know a few hundred dollars this week that you don't have a paycheck for. Or you have a line of credit borrow against that and then you pay it off the next week. Um, the commissioner said he doesn't think it's necessary, but it's one of those things that rather than having to call a special meeting or have us come in all at once, uh, this is the time we're going to be meeting anyway, so it's just it's good fiscal planning, but uh, something you hope you never have to use, and we hope you don't, uh, but if it, if it is necessary, we want to have it in place for him. So would taxpayers essentially be unaffected by this? It, you know, we do have to pay a small, I think it's a transaction fee or a, a little bit of money just to have that line of credit available to us. If we don't use it, obviously, then we don't have to pay any kind of interest or any kind of user fee on it. Okay. Also in that meeting, state tax collections, it was explain that they're higher than projected, but growth in the state is lower. State economist Tom Stinson said that it doesn't look good for November's budget forecast. So what are you preparing for? You know, a lot of what we see around the country. You know, you, you look at the economy is either flat or if it has been growing, the growth has slowed down. I think originally we had some 3% predictions here in Minnesota. That's now probably down to 1.8 or 1.5. Um, the good news out there is Minnesota's got a little bit better benefit than some of our other surrounding neighbors, uh, you know, to the south or even to the west, and then we've had some great crops this year. And that may be enough of a shock absorber to help us uh, maybe not, you know, grow way out of uh, our tough economic times, but maybe prevent it from being worse. So uh, we'll always plan for the worst and hope for the best. Now, last August, you announced a Reform 2.0 initiative, with 2012 being the session whereby your caucus will push to reform government. So what are some of the higher profile issues? you're pursuing. You know, and they're really, really not exciting things. It's uh, streamlining a government. It's maybe relieving some mandates from local government. It's uh, and a, lot, a lot of things that most people would think, well, we should have already done that. You know, we're in tough economic times. If the state of Minnesota requires a report on water quality along with the federal government, along with a local municipality, you know, can't we do it with just one? Or if you're going to have to come to government for a permit to renew a license, why do we ask you to come down to an office? Shouldn't we allow you to do it online just like you do with all kinds of renewals, whether it's you know, your dog license, whether it's for a credit card, whatever it may be, you renew a lot of things online now, and it may not necessarily be that you need to come to a government office. So things like that that are real simple but help out in a lot of standpoint. You look at a lot of local governments, we may not be able to help you with a, you know, an increase in an LGA or revenue side, but if we can reduce the expenses on the other side of the column, that really helps out at the local level. If November's budget forecast comes in lower than projected, is it too soon, in your opinion, to look ahead to next session and begin planning either more spending reductions or would additional revenue then be on the table? Sure. Well, we, I don't think it's ever too early to plan for, and the November forecast that will come out is kind of a preview of what will come in February. So I, I think we'll use that as a good guide as to where our economy is at, you know, a little snapshot in time, and then have a better opinion coming in February. But uh, we absolutely look at it as an opportunity to start that planning process. Uh, we don't believe uh, taxing small businesses is a good idea, uh, but we will look at some of those other 
other budget reductions, some things that uh, maybe the governor wasn't uh, you know, on the same page with us this last year. Uh, but again, based on the new forecast that comes out, maybe we'll have to look at in the future. Mr. Speaker, under this legislature, the state had its credit rating reduced to uh, AA plus. Some of the reasons given were the budget shifts and other short-term fixes used to balance the budget. So how much, in your opinion, of the onus of this is on the legislature? Well, I think it's on you know both us and the governor equally. You know, we can present him a budget, but if he doesn't sign it, it doesn't become law. Uh, if we don't present him a budget, there's nothing for him to to sign into law. So I think we both own it equally. Um, it's some some of the things that uh, again, from our standpoint, we didn't want to do. We didn't want to borrow. We didn't want to use those tobacco bonds for one time. You know, a stopgap for some of the health care funding. Uh, but it was what the governor was willing to sign, what we could also pass through the legislature and get to his desk. So uh, it's something that, uh, unfortunately, we're right there with the U.S. Uh, credit rating at AA+. I think it's maybe a sign of our economic times, uh, but also a time then to reassess what is important, what are our priorities, and then what are we going to fund going forward. And as you do that reassessing, let's talk a little bit about race. You know, obviously, it's going to be a hot-button topic next session. It's already talked about in the, in the Capitol here. So... Will it get any consideration from your caucus? And what if it was attached to paying schools back some of the money that's owed to them earlier than planned? Sure, and, and you know a lot of that comes uh, whether or not we have the votes. And I, you know, I've voted for it in the past, um, but we've got a different legislature now than we had even two years ago, or four years ago, or six years ago when it's passed the legislature. Uh, folks that on a a very uh, I would say fiscally conservative viewpoint say we don't need any additional revenue over here. We need to look at the money we're spending and increase or decrease the spending at that level and then prioritize. Uh, and then we have folks that are just absolutely, you know, opposed to uh, any kind of, of, of expansion of gambling. So I think it's a little different legislature and I don't know that we necessarily have the right answer, uh, but paying back the education shift, whether it's using any kind of Versino or gambling money, uh, is going to be a priority for our caucus to start that process of paying that back as quickly as possible. And when I asked you about new revenue a few minutes ago, you said taxing small businesses isn't the answer, but are there other options available that your caucus would consider that could generate additional revenue? Sure, and we've looked at that from a standpoint of other states and other countries. You know, you look at Greece has tried to, you know, they tried to raise taxes a couple different times to make up their budget shortfalls, and all they found was the month that they thought they were going to get didn't actually materialize. So now you've gone to the one place where you thought you were going to get revenue, now, not only do you not have that option anymore, now you've actually chased some of those folks to other countries or other states. So we think it's a priority to look at our budget, to see what our priorities are, to fund our priorities first. Then, you know, we believe in a private sector economy growth will actually help us. The more Minnesotans that go back to work, the more revenue they generate, the more it helps all of us. And uh, private sector economy growth is what we want, not necessarily government growth. So I don't really hear a yes, but I don't hear a no. What, no, we're not going to, we don't believe there are any taxes out there at this point in time that will help stimulate our economic growth and the private income. So uh, we're not interested in a tax increase. Okay, here's another one I have to throw your way. Of course, rumblings of a special session for a Viking stadium continue sure. to kind of be heard through the hallways here at the Capitol. So where does your caucus stand on that issue? And would you support a special session? And would you support the, the stadium, you personally? Sure. And, you know, Maury Lanning is our chief author in the House. And uh, I will tell you, Maury, along with Julie Rosen in the Senate, have been working very closely with the Vikings, with the governor's office. Uh, it's really hard for us. You know, we've got kind of a, I'd say, maybe a shell of a, uh, of a bill right now. Uh, but a number of our folks have said if we're going to raise any kind of tax, there's going to have to be a re re referendum on that. Now, I voted for, I voted against, I voted for the referendum on the Twins bill. It didn't pass, and as a Hennepin County resident, uh, I then voted against the bill. So I think that's where I've consistently been. Uh, but I don't ever you know, see one idea as the first, last, or best idea. So if this one isn't the one, if it doesn't work out, and especially when it comes to the local support, whether it be Ramsey County delegation or the St. Paul delegation, uh, being on board with the plan in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Arden Hill, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> forgot about it, uh, then where is that next plan? Is it, you know, in some other city or is it a different location? So I think we need to see first what the, the plan is, uh, get the report that's also going to be coming out, I believe, uh, later on next week. Right. Uh, to see what the actual assessment is going to be from the state standpoint, and then it gives us a little bit more of a full picture to look at as well. But we're always supportive of trade and keep the Vikings here, even when they're not winning, but we'll, we'll look at a creative solution that keeps them here and is tied to the game. That's the most important thing for us. Okay, Speaker of the House, Kurt Zellers, thank you for your time today. We certainly appreciate it. Always my pleasure.
After speculation of what and who might be included on former Governor Tim Pawlenty's official portrait, the unveiling Monday night displayed a simple, somber Pawlenty standing in front of the state capitol. As people pull alongside in life, shoulder to shoulder, in tough moments, and say, I'm with you, I'll stand with you, I'll help, I'll encourage, I'll support, I'll work, um, there isn't always in that moment the right way and the right time to look each in the eye and beyond and say thank you, I love you, and I'm appreciative and I'm grateful. Belgian artist Rawson painted the portrait of the 39th governor of Minnesota. It's hanging in the southwest corridor of the Capitol. Here to continue our conversation on broad policy reform and budget issues, we have Senate Minority Leader Tom Bach. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I want to begin with the LAC meeting from last week where the, the commission unanimously granted approval to borrow from a line of credit to meet cash flow needs if necessary. What do you think of that decision? Well, I think it's a, just a, a, a safeguard that was put into place. Uh, you know, our economy is very fragile, but revenue's been running slightly ahead of projections. Uh, I believe for the first quarter of the biennium, July through September, we're about $59 million over uh, the projections. Uh, so that's helpful. Uh, th the problem probably lies on the horizon. Uh, we, we concluded this uh, budget discussions and resolution in uh, July. Uh, and the entire state's cash flow account was rated. Uh, so what the Department of Finance then has to do is it does inner fund borrowing. Uh, so any uh, funds that are available, things like the Game and Fish Fund over at DNR, the Healthcare Access Fund that funds Minnesota Care, if there are any kind of surplus dollars, finance has the authority to move them around to make sure the state can pay its bills. But we're in a very precarious uh, situation. And I, I think it's a, a good safety measure. Okay, and you brought up the, the beginning of my second question, which is it was highlighted during that meeting that state tax collections are higher than projected, but growth is lower than projected, and this might not bode well for the November budget forecast. In your opinion, is there room for more budget reductions if necessary? Well, something will have to be done because uh, uh, the February forecast, uh, our state forecasting uh, uh, company, uh, forecasted that we'd have, I believe, about 3.2 to 3.4 percent GDP growth uh, in, in the next fiscal year. They have, have uh, downgraded that a number of times since February, and now we're at about 1.4 or 1.5 percent GDP growth next year. So what that means is we're going to be collecting less revenue. So I, I think it's uh, more likely than not that when the November forecast comes out, we'll have an additional deficit. And exactly how the Republican majorities deal with that uh, uh, is, I think, remains to be seen. Uh, last year, they made a decision to borrow $2.1 billion from our K-12 schools and then borrow money from uh, future receipts, sell a bond and, and borrow money from future budget years to resolve the, the short-term, uh, the, the long-term deficit with a short-term solution with borrowing. So. We'll have to see if they continue to go down that road of, of borrowing to balance the budget. I don't support that. Uh, I think we have to have an honest conversation about the structural uh, budget problems this state has. Uh, they've existed since 2002, and it happened because back in the 90s when the economy was really strong, uh, we cut income taxes two different times across the board on everybody. Uh, we took the general education levy off of people's homes and shifted that cost to the general fund. That cost the state about $900 million a year. And then when the economy slowed down starting in 2002, uh, many of those tax reductions that were made in the 90s now have not been sustainable. Uh, some of the decisions need to be revisited. My, my uh, biggest concern is it seems like every year when we come into session, every year except one since 2002, we've been managing a crisis. And we're going to be in the same situation this year, assuming the November forecast shows a deficit. We're going to come in in January and everybody's going to say, oh my gosh, another deficit, another crisis on our hands. And what concerns me about that is how do you make good de spending decisions, good investments about Minnesota's future if you're just constantly in a state of crisis management? And as former Senate tax chair, what would you do if you could recraft, say, the, the tax system right now to make it a little more progressive instead of regressive and be able to uh, bring in a, a consistent amount of revenue to the state? Well, I, I, part of the problem that we have is that we have a very progressive system. And I'm somebody that supports a, a progressive tax system, and the governor has talked about 
uh, wealthy Minnesotans are not paying their fair share. And clearly that's a true as a percentage of income. They pay less than, uh, than middle income people do. Uh, the challenge with a very progressive system is progressive systems also have a lot of volatility in them because uh, they're largely based on income, uh, both personal income and corporate income. And we're heavily dependent on that. About f almost 50% of the revenue we collect is from the income tax a personal income tax and another, depending on the year, 6 to 10 percent is corporate income tax. So when the economy slows down and income tax collections and corporate tax collections are down, uh, the state has these dips in revenue that creates deficits. So the challenge with a progressive system is if you're going to stay with one, you have to build larger budget reserves so that you can bridge those revenue shortfalls when you, know, you have uh, little blips in the economy. Uh, I support doing that. I think that's very difficult for the legislature to do because if you're going to stay with a very progressive system like ours, you probably need somewhere in the 3 to 5 percent in a budget reserve. We have, we have nothing today. And 3 to 5 percent, uh, you know, on a $35 billion budget, 5 percent is almost $1.8 billion. Very difficult for the legislature to leave that much money on the bottom line and not, and not spend it, either on programs or on tax cuts. And you've supported reform in the past that would expand but lower the sales tax statewide. Is, do you think proposals like that might garner, get any teeth, get any traction next session? Well, I met with the State Chamber of Commerce a week ago, uh, and I think it's kind of interesting that the business community has really been very absent in the discussions here. And I, I think if uh, the new Republican majorities are going to do something about tax reform and I was hopeful that they might, uh, but I, I asked the business community a week ago, aren't there going to be any tax committee hearings to talk about tax reform? And, and their answer was, well, we think it'll have to wait until 2013. This notion that we can just kick, keep kicking this problem down the road and, and, and somehow wish it away, you know, that's been happening for nine years here. And uh, it, it hasn't happened. It hasn't gotten better. It's not going to get better by itself. We're not going to grow our way out of this problem. We are going to need a comprehensive tax reform. And if you go to, the, uh, there's some room on the income tax uh, to, uh, to put people closer to the, paying the same percentage of their income in uh, uh, state and local taxes. And I do believe there's some room in the sales tax. Uh, our per capita sales tax collections, we're kind of down in the middle of the pack of states, uh, 15 to 19th or something like that. And that's because uh, we have a very narrow base that we tax uh, compared to most states. Uh, so I think there's some room on the sales tax. I think you have to lower the rate if you're going to expand it to, uh, uh, to other things in order to take some of the angst uh, out of it in the part of the public. Okay, Senator, we're almost out of time, but I have two more topics I do want to touch on here. One, Racino, hot, but hot button topic next session to be sure. Would you support it? I don't support it. I have not uh, ever supported it, but that's not, it really has nothing to do with the Racino to me. It just it's more about gaming. Uh, when the state lottery was on the ballot in 1998, uh, just as a private citizen, I voted against it. I, I don't believe the state should be in the gambling business. I think it sends a, a real poor message to young people that uh, somehow you can buy a ticket and, and, and you can make it without having to work for it. So I, I, I just uh, fundamentally believe that, that, uh, that gaming should not be a venue that the state is involved in. And of course, we also want to talk about the Viking Stadium. There have been some rumors that there could be a special session attached to a stadium bill. Would you support, first of all, a special session? And as a former chief author of a Viking Stadium bill, would you support the bill? It's kind of a framework right now, but would you support it as it stands? Well, I, I, I don't know exactly what it even looks like, because I think what's kind of interesting is when I was the author of the Vikings uh, Stadium bill in, in 2010, uh, I had two different committee hearings in the Senate on it. We, we tried to kind of flush that issue out and, and see if we could uh, get some public input and find people's best ideas. The Republican majority, since they took over the legislature, they talk about a bill, but the truth is neither in the House or the Senate have they had a hearing on anything. Uh, so uh, we're not making very good headway. I actually put a call into the governor's office last week and suggested uh, that the governor have the four legislative leaders into his office and just have a sit down about are we going to do this or not. Uh, I do think the owners of the Vikings are getting very impatient. Uh, there's a, they've done, uh, I think, what the Republican majority in the legislature has asked them to do. Uh, they were asked to do a number of things. One was go out and find a site. Right. And they did. Right. They, they settled on Arden Hills. They found a county board that supports them. Uh, they were told, 
well, you know, you ha you're going to have to put $400 million into the project. Uh, they've done that. Uh, uh, that Arden Hills site, uh, the Vikings are going to put $400 million into that project. That is a bigger percentage of the project than the Polad family put into uh, Target Field for the Twins. So I, I think they're getting frustrated. They're doing what uh, they're, they're told they should go and do. Go out and find a local partner. They did. They found Ramsey County. And still no response on the part of the legislature, not even one committee hearing. So uh, I understand their frustration. So I, I just do think that the governor's got to get the leaders in, put the issue on the table, and say, you know, what are the obstacles and can we get there? And if we can't, then let's just tell the public. And let's tell the owners that, no, we can't figure out how to get there. I think if you wait until after the November forecast and the state has uh, what's likely to be another budget deficit, I think that makes getting this, the stadium issue e on the front burner even more difficult. So what does your gut tell you at this point, being somebody who's been so close to this issue for so long? Uh, I think uh, unless we see more leadership out of the Republican majorities, and there's, there's little I can do being in the minority except to, to try and encourage people to sit down at the table and try to figure this out. Uh, uh, absent the Republican majority is taking a larger role. And there's some risk in this because uh, it's not popular. And the whole professional sports model is broken nationally. Uh, all across the country, there's some kind of public financing that goes into uh, stadium construction. So the business model is broken. I don't believe we're going to fix it in Minnesota. I think the question is whether we kind of want to suck it up and, and, and just admit that we're gonna, the state's going to have to participate along with the, the county and the owner uh, to build a, a good multi-use facility. And I do think if the Vikings leave, there are a lot of Minnesotans going to be very, very disappointed. Okay, on that note, Senator Tom Bach, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your time as always. Thank you. The lights at the state capitol will soon be dimmed and characters representing its storied past will soon come to life. The annual Shadows and Spirits tour will soon be underway. It doesn't you know, pick up on any ghost stories you know, that might be rumors throughout uh, the history of the building. What it does is it brings to life historical people who would have had a connection to the history of the Capitol. For instance, we have Clara Uland, who was a woman suffragist, who was really a strong proponent of getting the women's right to vote. And that uh, portrays her in 1915 as a historical spirit that shows up to uh, kind of visit with the, the visitors in the Capitol. We've discussed the state's cash flow concerns in this week's Capitol Report. When those concerns arise, it's typically because of a shortage in the state's general fund. That fund is distributed to many areas within state government. John Bruhn explains some of the state's general fund implications on education, health care, and state government. Minnesota's state budget is managed through a wide variety of funds. This combination of state and federal funds could be thought of as separate checkbooks. Within each is an amount of money that, together, provides for the operation of state government. Of all funds, the state general fund is by far the largest and most important. Minnesota's budget actually consists of about three dozen major funds, the largest of which is the general fund. And just as it sounds, the general fund is general. It's flexible. It's the largest, most flexible resource in the state budget and in the most recently enacted budget it makes up about 54 percent of the overall budget. The general fund stands apart from the others because it is flexible. Lawmakers and the governor have the ability to move dollars to different areas as needs arise. Economic circumstances change, priorities change, and being able to react and allocate money to meet priorities is an important function of the budgeting process that the legislature and governor engage in. Um, additionally, the, the general fund is the predominant focus of the budget debate at the Capitol every two years when the biennial budget is enacted. The general fund, different than dedicated resources, needs to be actually actively acted upon. The legislature sets a two-year appropriation law, and that law needs to be enacted with the signature of the governor um, every two years. So it needs more direct, hands-on involvement in legislature through the appropriations process. The general fund is considered a non-dedicated fund. 
its flexibility allows lawmakers and the governor to use this money for practically any state government need. The other funds that make up the balance of the state operating budget are considered to be dedicated. These include revenue from state and federal sources. Money is essentially deposited into these funds for specific purposes. For instance, the state receives money from the federal government for Medicaid payments or highway construction, while other state dollars are dedicated for things like the Health Care Access Fund or natural resources. For the most part, funds outside the general fund have a dedicated purpose. Within that fund, there's typically some flexibility, um, but it has a more narrow focus. A key difference is dedicated funds often are, um, by law, set in terms of how is the money going to come in and what may it be used for. The general fund, by contrast, uh, the money essentially goes into a big pot. It's a general in its function and the legislature can allocate it how it sees fit. And it has that discretion and that flexibility and does so every two years in the appropriations process by setting a biennial budget and then modifying it often in the supplemental budget year. When money comes into the state, it is separately deposited into the appropriate fund. Revenue placed in the general fund comes from numerous sources, but two areas in particular make up the bulk of the fund. The general fund being the biggest fund in the state budget um, has an, a number of major revenue sources, but actually the two largest are the individual income tax and sales tax. Between the two make up about three quarters of the revenue in the general fund. Um, there are a variety of other taxes, um, statewide property tax, corporate income tax, that also contribute resources to the general fund. But the, over a long period of time, about three quarters of the general fund has come from those two revenue sources. Once money is deposited into the general fund, it is distributed to many areas of the state budget, a majority of which is concentrated in two specific areas. About three quarters of the state's general fund budget goes to K-12 education and health and human services. So money to school districts and charter schools through the education budget and health and human services, most of the money in that budget area pays for health care services for individuals who are low income, elderly or disabled. Beyond that, um, a wide array of government services, the higher education systems in Minnesota, local units of government. Beyond that, public safety and corrections. Um, environmental programs, transit programs, so it really covers a whole spectrum of what state government funds. Keep in mind that the general fund is the largest of all funds that make up the state operating budget. It is not a dedicated fund, meaning it can be used for just about any state government need. And on occasion, revenue from other funds may be transferred into the general fund. Because of this flexibility, it is a major focus of the state budget process. Trying to meet the priorities of the state through this flexible resource is really what a lot of the budget debate at the Capitol is about. Um, the fact that there are many competing priorities is what often makes balancing the general fund difficult, aside from the fact that the major revenue sources in the general fund can be very sensitive to the economy. If the economy does well, general fund revenues tend to do well. If the economy is doing poorly, general fund revenues tend to suffer and create shortfalls in the general fund. That concludes this week's Capitol Report. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.